This is the second episode in the series, It's What He Would Have Wanted, on the Phantoms of the Opera channel, and I have had a cold. So please forgive any croakiness in my speaking or singing voice. Today we are going to be listening to the seduction aria from Massenet's Sappho, which was written specially for Emma Calvé. Here we have a dedication which Massenet wrote on the first page of Calvé's score. All these pages I have written with the constant thought of you. They must live through you. They belong to you doubly, and I offer them to you with an expression of my infinite gratitude. My dear wife and I admire you, love you, and thank you. Massenet, Paris, Saturday the 27th of November, 1897. First representation, Théâtre de l'Opéra Comique. These might have been the only words that Calvé had for Massenet on the day of the first performance, because he couldn't stand the nervous strain of the premiere, so he went home and went to bed, whilst Calvé received a standing ovation from not only the audience, but also the orchestra and the president of France. It was an undisputed triumph. But how could it have failed to be when it was written for the unique talents of one of the greatest performers in the world? A critic wrote, Not only has Calvé one of the most marvellous voices ever heard, an absolutely pure style, a perfect method, but she shows herself the equal of the most perfect and experienced among celebrated actresses. Opera singers are not often known for their acting abilities, but there were some at the time whose acting talents were greater than their singing talents, and they were admired just as much as the ones who had very beautiful voices but weren't so hot on the drama. Calvé had both. She could stand up alongside the greatest actors of the day and the greatest singers. So here we have a role written for a very rare type of performer who can sing and act equally well. But that wasn't the only thing about Sappho that made this role unique. Calvé was very proud that Massenet had written two operas especially for her. Sappho, taken from Alphonse Daudet's novel of the same name, has been one of my most successful creations. Massenet wrote it for the special and individual notes in my voice, those unusual tones of which I have already spoken. She was referring to the fourth voice, which we made a video about recently. If you haven't seen it, I'll put up a link to it. I recommend having a look because it is fascinating what we find out about what made it so special and unusual. The fourth voice was described as a kind of ventriloquism. You can't quite tell where the sound is coming from. It seems to be distant, like a far-off echo. And this was the effect that Massenet wanted to exploit when writing this role. So now we have a, a soprano who has to be also an excellent actress and singer, but also who can use this technique which very few people in the world at the time knew how to do. It's getting harder and harder to recast this role if ever you wanted to put the opera on again. Calvé recorded the most famous aria from the opera 22 years after the premiere. Her voice was no longer in its prime and she wasn't able to use all the magical effects that she would have brought it to life with at the time of the first performances and she transposed it down to make it a little easier. But although she wasn't the same Calvé that had electrified audiences as Sappho over 20 years earlier, there's still a lot we can learn from this record. To start with, she varies the tune a little bit from what Massenet wrote, something which these days is considered unthinkable in an opera of this era and style. She adds some little grace notes into the tune, small passing notes that are not written on the score. So instead of hearing... She sings with 
which I think is very pretty. Straight away we can hear the most delicious legato. So although the notes go up and down a bit, we don't hear that. We hear this fluid line flowing through. And this is a song of seduction. So the legato seems to work in this sinuous and sensuous way. That is very seductive. We can also hear that she's using a lot of rubato. She's not singing exactly the rhythms that Massonet wrote but by pulling around the time, holding back and then rushing ahead of the beat, she creates a sense of tension and release that is also very exciting. I suspect that the long high A, which Massonet has marked PP, he wanted her to sing in her fourth voice, which would be a wonderful effect, but she doesn't sing it in fourth voice here, and as she's transposed the whole piece down a tone, that A becomes a G, so maybe that was a little bit too low for her fourth voice, at least to jump up to in that context. She might have found it easier to go to a note higher than that in her fourth voice and bring it down but she doesn't sound very comfortable singing it in her head voice either. She has to cut it short, so maybe she made a, an artistic decision at the last minute to go for head voice, and that didn't feel right either. It could be a moment she wasn't particularly pleased with herself, so let's move on without studying it too closely. There's the fourth voice on that high B-flat, which in the case of this record becomes a high A-flat. It really is a striking effect that I think very few people will be able to pull off. Now hands up who noticed that she's changed the tune again, and this time by more than adding in a couple of grace notes. At the section marked plus anime, she instead of rising by a third, she rises by a semitone, which creates a dissonance. And then again at But 
by rising more gradually like this and creating this dissonance, there's more of an effect of tension building up, mounting to this climactic A, or in her case a G, which she holds uh, for so long it really does feel like the climax of the piece, or up until that point. What Massonet actually wrote was, Your curtain name is And I think I prefer the version that Calvé sang. Do you think Massonet changed his mind about it after he'd written the score and told her to sing it this way instead? Or was it her own choice? Or do you think maybe after 20 years she misremembered the tune? Well, unless I can get hold of her own score and see her markings on it, I don't see how I can answer that. In the early 19th century, composers didn't expect a singer to sing the notes exactly as they were on the page. Uh, By the end of the 19th century, the composers were being a lot more uh, um, explicit about how they wanted their music to be performed. You see a lot more markings of dynamics and expressions coming up on the score, and singers adhered to the, the written notes more than they had done previously. Today it's generally considered sacrilege to divert from the the composer's notes at all. But maybe this goes to show that uh, Massonet and perhaps other composers of his generation didn't mind it so much. But there is another recording, more faithful to the score, which we have to listen to at least part of. It was recorded in 1903 with Massonet himself playing the piano, and it was sung by Georgette Leblanc, who was, as well as being an opera singer, an actress. She acted on the stage and in early films. She sang a lot of Massonet's works, and I think we can probably tell why he liked her. But although he might have admired her performance of Sappho um, enough to want to record some of it with her, these recordings were never actually published, so... Perhaps the singer or the composer weren't happy with the result. It was recorded on a wax cylinder, which was a more primitive recording technology than was used for Calvé's record some 16 years later. So the quality isn't as good, and they were also limited for time, so they couldn't record the entire aria and had to stop before the end. But you can still get a sense of the style, the way she sings it, and as well as singing it in the original pitch, she also doesn't add in any extra notes. In fact, she's very faithful to the score. giving us very fluid lines and those beautiful slides between notes, not overdone, but just very elegant. I think that does make her sound very persuasive and appealing. And I want to say that she sings it caressingly, but I know that's not a thing. I hope, though, that you can understand and hear what I mean by it. And like Calvé, she uses rubato for expression and excitement. Just as it's written in the score, she sings that high A pianissimo very softly and delicately. It almost has the effect of Calvé's fourth voice, except that it doesn't have that uh, feeling as though she's suddenly stepped into a different room, that echo-like coming from a distant sound. It's just a very light, very sweet head note and a beautiful effect. 
I think she must have been quite a seductive Sappho. I will upload in separate videos both of these recordings so you can hear them in full. They really are worth listening to. The Georgette Leblanc version is quite rare and the Calvé one, I've never heard a good transcription of it before because it has to be played on a specific machine. But fortunately, thanks to some friends, in the summer I had the chance to play it on just the right machine and make this transcription for you. So I'll add a link to that so you can hear them. But now let's get an idea of how a modern prima donna tackles this very difficult aria. I would usually like to use more than one recording to compare, but this isn't put on very often these days. It isn't recorded very often either. Maybe it's because Massonet isn't very fashionable anymore, which I think is such a shame because I just adore his music. Or maybe it's because of that old problem of finding just the right actress-singer for the main role. You don't want to put this on and, and have her be unconvincing in the part and not uh, uh, irresistible and seductive enough and not really convincing with her acting or strong uh, with her singing technique. So unfortunately I only have one recording that was made in recent years and live, but she is a very successful, very well-known soprano, so I think she'll do a good job of representing the modern sound for us. Let's not even talk about the fact that she's out of tune, which is accentuated by her very wide and uneven vibrato. But instead, let's listen for the legato and rubato that was so much a part of the performances of those two Sapphos of Massenet's day, um, who he, he loved to hear sing this aria. Um, we're not hearing any of it here. There's no legato. Every note is separated from the others. And as for Rubato, she's trying to sing everything in time, um, which is, I mean, there's no indication in the score that she shouldn't. But when we listen to the recordings um, for Massenet's Sapphos, we can hear that uh, the use of Rubato gives this shape to the line, which was probably what he expected to hear and expected them to understand that that was part of the phrase. And also we're hearing the breathy, gasping kind of expression that is so popular today, um, which, as I've said previously, is a wonderful technique in front of a mic, but doesn't really carry in the opera house. So uh, it's definitely not something that Massenet would have expected or heard. Now that pianissimo floated high note, or a note in fourth voice if you can manage it, that we've all been waiting for, um, she actually, instead of singing it much quieter and softer, sings it at the same volume that she's been singing the rest of the phrase, except she does a clever trick. She gets much louder and forceful just before it, so it sounds like she's done this wonderful effect of pulling the voice back, whereas actually she's just got louder and then suddenly gone back to her normal level. And if you're waiting for that climactic loud high A, she doesn't deliver it. She sings it very quietly with a very thin sound. <laughs> Thank you. 
tempest is made to pull back on that high note for an echo-like effect. In fact, she gets louder on it. And uh, finally, I have to point out that I can't hear any of the words, can you? She seems to be making every vowel the same, and the consonants aren't clear either. Okay, I know I said finally already, but there is just one more thing. She's moving around a lot, but according to Calve, this is the exact opposite of what she should be doing. Sappho, as I have said, was taken from Alphonse Daudet's book. I knew the distinguished writer and used to visit him in his charming house at Jean Rosé. We were talking of Sappho one day and discussing the presentation of the character on the stage. Remember the phrase of Baudelaire, Daudet admonished me. Beware of movements which break the line. Few gestures, I beg of you. Be restrained, calm, classic. She is called Sappho in the play because she posed for the statue of the Greek poetess. So has she seduced you? I have to confess it doesn't work for me. So do you think that if an opera has been written for a very specific and rare type of performer, that it shouldn't be put on again until a similar artist has come along? Would it do more harm to do it badly than to not do it at all? And how much freedom of interpretation should the singer have, given what we know about what the composer and the writer wanted? In our next episode of It's What He Would Have Wanted, we will be looking at a role which was also written for a very extraordinary voice, but that hasn't stopped many tenors from attempting to take on the challenge. If you're looking forward to that, then don't forget to like and subscribe and tap the notifications button so that you'll know as soon as it's uploaded. And stay tuned for the next seance with the Phantoms of the Opera.